Hi, this is Prashant Bharadwaj. In this module, we will talk about master scheduling, which is the second level in the hierarchy of operating decisions. The first level, as we have discussed in the past, is aggregate plan. The aggregate plan, as the name indicates, looks at an aggregate entity and the master schedule looks at the disaggregate of an aggregate plan and disaggregation can be done based on product families labor force and time so for example if the aggregate plan is for furniture items the master schedule will be disaggregating that into specific chairs specific tables specific desks so on if the aggregate plan is for number of Ford vehicles, then the disaggregation or the master schedule will be for each of the models. Or once we know that we are going to make X number of Toyota Camrys, the disaggregation will be based on number of auto transmission vehicles, number of manual transmission, number of red white, black, blue, different colors of vehicles. Toyota Corollas, which have power windows and power locks, which do not have power window power locks. So disaggregation can be done in terms of product families. It can also be done in terms of labor force. Like we have discussed earlier, if the aggregate plan is for the number of IUP faculty, then the master schedule can be disaggregate of the aggregate plan in terms of number of faculty in the College of Business, in the College of Sciences, in the College of Fine Arts, in the College of Education, so on. Or if the aggregate plan is for the number of faculty in the College of Business, then the disaggregation can be the number of faculty in marketing, accounting, finance, management, and so on. Finally, disaggregation can be done based on time. That is, if the aggregate plan is for the next 6 to 18 months on a monthly basis, the disaggregation of the master schedule can be based on weekly basis. Or if the aggregate plan is on a quarterly basis, the disaggregation can be on a monthly basis. And Typically, I underline the term typically here because this is not, there is no hard and fast rule that it has to be on a weekly basis for two to six months. But in most, especially manufacturing companies, the master schedule is for the next eight weeks, two months to 24 weeks or six months. So what is the purpose of the master schedule? To specify the production quantity of each end item in each time period and also to specify the quantity of each type of service in each time period if you are a service oriented company. So basically we are talking about quantity and timing of production. Now keep in mind in master schedule we are talking about how much to produce and when to produce not how much order has to be shipped. That is translated into the production quantity in the master production schedule, which will become more clear in a few minutes. Now, before we get into how the master production schedule works, I want you to understand that sometimes the master schedule may be specified for sub-assemblies or raw materials instead of end items. And I want you to realize right now the difference between the master schedule and MRP, the next stage in the planning hierarchy. Master schedule is for typically end items, but sometimes for sub-assemblies and raw materials, like we will see with some examples. But MRP, the next level, you plan for everything, from end items to sub-assemblies to components to raw materials. So that is the purpose of the master schedule. Now, the inventory strategies of make to stock, assemble to order and make to order, they go hand in hand with some of the master production schedule strategies. 
let's see what uh, we mean by that with this example on the next page. This illustration I have taken from this book, Heiser and Render, which is a textbook on operations management. Let's take the example of a print shop. What are the major inputs in a print shop? Paper and ink. Different types of paper, different types of ink. But the number of end items are much, much higher than the number of inputs. Using the same paper and ink, you can make a brochure, hundreds of different kinds of brochures. You can print a textbook, you can print a flyer, you can print a notebook, on and on and on. So the number of inputs are few, whereas the number of end items are huge in a typical make-to-order, process-focused type of business. Now let's go to this extreme here and where the scenario is make to stock product focus or we also call that stock to forecast instead of make to stock sometimes. So the example here can be beer, light bulb, bread, steel, so on, where the number of inputs again are relatively small. The commonality of these products is very high. And you may be making different kinds of beer, but not a whole lot different kinds of beer. You may be making different kinds of bread in the same bakery, but the variety is not a whole lot as compared to this example of a print shop. And also here it is more standardized products. Here it is more customized. So in this case you can make the stock. That is the difference between these two extremes, make to stock and make to order. Customized, standardized. Now let's look at the intermediate option here with the example of an automobile. The number of inputs in an automobile definitely as we can imagine is extremely high. The number of end items which some people may not realize is extremely high. If you take all the options that you can see in an automobile, a typical automobile, and look at the number of unique end items, that can range in several thousands. The same auto transmission car can come with or without power windows, with or without power locks, with or without power steering, with or without a DVD player, with or without GPS navigation system, with or without leather seats, and I can go on, on and on. The same sedan can come in six different colors. So if you take all of these options for every specific type of option, the number of end items, unique end items can be in thousands. Whereas the number of sub-assemblies or the modules are less or few. So for example, the same auto transmission, the transmission or the engine goes into a red color car or a black color car or a different color car. The same engine goes into the car which has leather interior or cloth interior. The same engine goes into the vehicle which has power windows, power locks, or no power windows, power locks. So the point I'm trying to make here is the number of inputs are huge, number of end items are huge, but the number of modules like transmissions, engines, types of uh, doors, types of steering, if you take all of these, those are much, much smaller compared to the end items on the inputs. So this case we call it assemble to order meaning whenever there is an order from a distributor in the case of autos you will have to start from this stage and start assembling. You will not start from this stage like you would in this case. Here you make to order you start from scratch to finish. Here you start from this stage. You would be ready up to this point. You will have the engines, the transmissions and other major modules or sub-assemblies ready 
and then you start assembling them together. If these three scenarios are clear, you have few number of modules, the wrist, the casing, the instrument itself, the mechanical instrument inside the watch, a wristwatch, and the dial. But using those combinations, you can have a large number of end items. And of course, the number of inputs are also huge. So there are many examples of assemble to order. Laptops can also be under assemble to order. So highly standardized, customized, and in between. Make to order, assemble to order, make to stock. Now going back here, now we can understand what these are. In make to stock, you have product focus companies, assemble to order, many customized end items using standard subassemblies and components. In make to order, you have process focused, customized products. Now, what about the master production schedule? What is the relationship of the MPS to this? In these companies, my MPS will be for this. That is the number, the inputs, the raw materials. And you would schedule the orders. In this case, my master production schedule will be for the end items. You schedule the finished product at the MPS level. Whereas here, you schedule at the sub-assembly or the module stage. So my master schedule will be for this. Okay, so MPS, MPS, MPS. Now let's look at a, a typical master production schedule computer printout. If you look at this simple example, you have an eight-week planning horizon of this master production schedule. And this is typically a rolling horizon. So right now we are at the end of September and we are planning for October and November. After one week, I'll be here. I'll be at the beginning of the second week of October. So this will become my week number one in the planning horizon, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The first week of December will become my eighth week in the planning horizon. So that is what is called the rolling planning horizon. Another term that I want you to know is freezing the master schedule. A lot of companies, they can freeze one or two or as many weeks as they would like to. What that means is, if I freeze weeks one and two in the planning horizon, I will not accept any orders for the first two weeks in my planning horizon. If anybody places an order for this product, it has to be for week three and beyond. That is called freezing. So in, th in this example, the item is chair. We are planning for the master production schedule for the chair. We have 45 units of this chair on hand. And the order policy, which is discussed in the inventory control uh, and also the MRP sections, is 80 units. At this stage, we will just understand that if you want to order this chair in-house, that is produce it, you will produce it in quantities of 80. Nothing less, nothing more. Even if you need two of these, you would make 80. That is what the order policy is. The MPS is sort of a meeting place of sales, marketing, and operations and inventory. It's a very, very important tool, especially in manufacturing companies. So let's look at what are these five rows in the master production schedule. This first one that you see here is input. Where do you get the input, uh, the forecast input? Typically from marketing, right? So marketing has provided the forecast, which is the first four weeks, that is October, it is 20. For some reason, the forecast is double that in November. So this is an input from marketing. The next row, 
the actual customer orders. This is the forecast. This is the real customer orders. Obviously, that will come from sales. So you have 23, 15, 8, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now keep in mind, we are here right now in time. So there is no real cause for concern that it, these are 0, 0, 0 because this is four weeks away still. So you may receive orders and this number will change. Same thing with these and these. In this example, we will assume that only the imminent week, the first week is frozen. So you will not receive any more orders for week number one. And you can see that 20 was an underestimate. Your demand is actually 23. Now is 50 and 15 and does this mean this was an overestimate? We don't know because we are still here. We have one more week to elapse before we come here. So who knows? This 15 can become 20 or 18 or 22. We don't know. Okay. So right now when you're planning, you are going to plan based on both of these numbers. Now in week one, for my planning purposes, my demand is 23 because I'm right here. I'm going to use the real customer orders, which happen to be more than the forecast 23. But for week two, what is my demand for planning purposes? It is 20, not 15. Why? Because you still have one more week. So this may change. And what would it change to? Nobody knows for sure. But my forecast is what I want to use to plan my demand. So which is 20. For the same reason, for planning purposes in week three, my demand is 20, 20. But when I go to week number five, six, seven, eight, the demand for my planning purpose is 40, 40, 40, 40. Okay. Now let's calculate the projected on-hand inventory. The key here is projected. That is expected. This is like forecast. That is you forecast to have an inventory, these quantities. So let's see how we got those numbers. What is my initial inventory? We know that it is 45. So I started off with 45. So what is my demand in week one? It is 23, not 20, 23, because this is the real order, which is 23. 45 minus 23 is this 22. Now when I come to week two, what is my demand? 20. Real order is 15, but like I said earlier, for planning purposes, it is 20 because you are still here in time. 22 minus 20 is the 2. MPS quantity is the actual production. This is an output which will go to production. So the MPS quantity is 0 in these two weeks because you have positive inventory. You have more than what you need. You had 45, more than 23. In this case, you have 22 more than 20. So you ended up with two even without producing anything. Now when you come to week eight, pay attention here. My requirement is 20. I have only two units in inventory. So obviously I cannot survive without getting some more units because I'm short. Short by how much? 18, one eight. So should my MPS quantity be 18? It could be, but what, what do we say here? The order policy is 80. So you cannot make 1, 2, 18, 20, whatever number you have to make, 80. That is my MPS quantity. So you're producing 80. Add that to this 2 in inventory from the last week, that is 82 minus my forecast 20. So you project to have 62 at the end of week three. Before I go further, I want you to understand this 80. What does this mean? 80 units of these chairs should be ready. Mark that word, ready, completed in week three. Not started. This is not the quantity being shipped or ordered by the customer. This is not the quantity that has to be started or purchased. 
this is the quantity that should be completed, ready, produced. If it was something that was ordered, it should have arrived in week three. Okay, that is what this number 80. Going back and looking at other numbers, 62 minus 20 is 42. So no need for any production, no MPS quantity. 42 minus 40 is 2. So still we have two units, nothing to produce. Now going back to the week 6, same scenario as week 3. You need 40, but you have only 2. So you're short by 38. So this could have been 38, but our order policy says 80. So you produce 80. If you produced 80 and got 80 in week 6, add that to the two units in inventory. 82 minus 40, 42. 42 minus 40, 2. And then week 8, same thing as here. You need 80. You need really 38, but you receive 80 because of the order policy. 82 minus 40, 42. Pretty straightforward. Good. Now the last row. This is an output to salespeople. This is telling the salespeople how many units are available to promise to customers who are placing orders at a later stage. Now, how did we get this seven? Now look at this. To calculate these numbers, just forget about this row completely, the forecast row. Just look at the customer orders row because that is the real customer order. So available is the real available quantity. Okay. How much is available in the beginning? 45. Now, what is the first instance in this planning horizon when you received more of these chairs? Are you getting anything in week one? None. Week two? None. Hey, week three, you're getting 80 more. So what does this mean? Any demand that occurs in weeks one and two would have to be met using this 45. Correct? Because you don't have any more units. But week three, yeah, you have 80 more units coming in. So if there is more demand here in week three and beyond, you have this 80 to fall back on. But in weeks one and two, you have nothing other than this 45. Now out of this 45, how much is already committed? to customer orders. Look at this. These two, 23 plus 15, 38. Why did I again add only 23 and 15 and not 8? Because 8 is in week 3. In week 3, you're getting 80 more units. So I would not worry about meeting this demand using this 45. I could use this 80 to meet this. So only this 38 units have to be met using the initial inventory. So 45 minus 38 is that 7. Now when you come to week 3, you're getting 80 units here. What is the next time period or instance at which you will get another 80 here, which is week 6? So any demand that you have in weeks 3, 4, and 5, which is 12, 8 plus 4 plus 0, should be met using this 80. So 80 minus this 12 is this 68 is available. Now this 80 after this, the next one is here. So these two time periods, you will have to meet the demand using this 80, which is zero at this time. 80 minus zero is 80. 80 minus this zero is 80. A lot of companies, they will have the cumulative ATP, which is seven, seven what would this number be this is seven the same seven is available here seven plus 68 is 75 75 this will be 155 155 235 now if i ask the question if the customer if the salesperson receives an order for 50 units in week number two can they accept that order so you would look at week two, what is the available to promise? Seven units. 50 units of new order cannot be accepted in week two unless something else changes. 
unless you move this 80 to week 2 if that is feasible but assuming that nothing can change an order of 50 in week number 2 is not possible to be accepted whereas for week 3 the same order of 50 not a problem because you have 75 available so these kinds of very dynamic decisions imagine a company which has hundreds of salespeople who are looking at the master production schedule and looking at the available to promise based on which they are accepting orders, not accepting orders, moving the due dates to a later stage, to an earlier stage, and see how that will impact the available to promise. All of that is done using the master production schedule. So this is a very important meeting point of sales, marketing, and operations and production. Hope that gives you an idea of how the MPS works. Now what are some of the responsibilities of the master production schedule which we already discussed? Match production based on delivery requirements like we did just now. You match the production based on delivery requirements. Right? These are the delivery requirements and you match the production. Look at this, 80, 80, 80. It has no apparent relationship with the actual requirement or even this forecast. It is not directly related. It doesn't look like, but obviously it is related to that. In some companies, you may decide when you are producing certain products and what quantities based on which the customers can specify the deadlines. In some companies you may decide when to produce and how much to produce based on which the salespeople can tell the customers when they'll be receiving their orders as opposed to asking when the orders need to be shipped and coming back and planning the production. That is what this bullet is talking about. Either match production based on delivery requirements or specified delivery dates based on production. Evaluate top-down directives. What I mean by that is, I said here, what if there is a demand for 50 units in week two? We said we can't accept it, right? But what if this order of 50 is from your number one customer who is responsible for 40% of your sales? Would you say no to that customer? Top management or the vice president of sales and marketing would say, I don't care what your master production schedule says. I want you to meet this order of 50 units in week number two. So you're going to probably move this 80 here. Whatever you have to do, that is done and accounted for in the master production schedule. It becomes the responsibility of the MPS to accept this top-down directive. The third bullet in the next slide is bottom-up scenarios, which means you have planned that 80 units will be completed in week 3, 6, and 8. Now, what if the raw materials don't arrive on time? What if there is a machine breakdown? What if there is absenteeism of key uh, employees? All of these are going to be disrupted. But it is a responsibility, again, of the MPS to figure out how to make the change so that you can come back to what was planned or what is the impact of these different changes. So these are the three major responsibilities of the master production schedule. Finally, what are the constraints for an MPS? Number one, the demand, the aggregate plan. The forecast or the real demand is translated into the aggregate plan which is translated to the master production schedule. So if you say you're going to make 1,000 pieces of furniture in the aggregate plan, then every chair, table, desk, etc. that you're making should add up to the amount that you specified in the aggregate plan. It may not be the exact number, but it has to be in the same ballpark. Second, 
you have to look at capacity. Finally, you want to minimize setup and holding costs. And holding costs. Now, if I have a demand, I'll give you a simple example here. Your demand is 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 in six weeks. Your one option is to produce 300 in week number one. Right? Then will you meet the demand? Yes. The total demand in six weeks is 300. You produced everything at once. Another option is to have 100, 100, 100. Another option is to have 150, 150. Another option is to have 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 meet the demand exactly with the same production. Which one would you prefer? You cannot answer that question right now because you don't know what it costs to set up, what it costs to hold in inventory. If you look at the first option, you are setting up to produce this product once only and done. So you'll have minimal setup costs among all these options. But your holding costs will be high. Why? At the end of one time period, you would have 250 left in inventory because out of this 300, only 50 got used. At the end of week two, you have still 200 left, 150 left, 100 left, 50 left, which you will use up here. So your holding cost will be extremely high compared to the last option here. In the last option, is there a holding cost? None. You need 50, you made 50. 50, 50, so on. But how about the setup cost? You are setting up six different times here for the same product, which means the cost of setting up will be high. So I want you to understand at this time that these two costs, setup and holding, they are inversely proportional. If one goes up, if setup goes up, the holding goes down. Right? So here the setup is low, holding is high. Here the setup is high, holding is low. What we are concerned about is a combination of these two costs. So we have to make sure that you minimize both together. So these are the constraints of the master production schedule. So this gives you an idea of some basics about MPS. Thank you.